let me just give you my sort of high level view of the way I see Kubernetes and how it semantically is going to affect us um, as developers. Obviously, if you talk to somebody who knows the guts and goes deep, they'll start talking about how this is an event, asynchronous event driven system and all that. But we'll talk, we can talk about some of that too as it comes up. So I keep using the word cluster because that's what's that's that's the kind of outer layer of Kubernetes. We need a cluster. The cluster is essentially going to define the environment, the, the compute environment that we're going to be living in. So I kind of look at it as a sandbox that all of the services that we're going to be building that need to run will exist within the scope of this cluster. This cluster is going to have within it compute power in the form of nodes or machines that will be available to us to use. Now, in the early days of Kubernetes, I had been, it's probably like 2015, I'd gone to, um, I think it was the OSCON conference in Portland. And it was at a time where Kelsey Hightower was just starting to kind of talk and introduce Kubernetes to the world. And he gives this great, you know, like Kelsey does, demo level talks where he's bringing up a cluster and adding nodes and doing all this crazy stuff. And, and at the end of the talk, I went up to him and I said, dude, you know, as always, I love the talk, but I, what was bothering me is that you never talked about the machines. Like, where are the machines in this cluster? I, I can't visualize where the machines are. And he looked at me and he started laughing. And he's like, Bill, the whole point of my conversation was to, it, to, to abstract the machine away. The whole point of Kubernetes at this level here is that you don't care about machines. All you really care about is that there's some compute power that we can access to run our services on. And then at first it really bothered me that he was like wanting to hide the machines from me. But then I started to realize, you know what, it's probably a good semantic to have in your head. Who cares if there's one machine or 20 machines back there providing all that sort of compute power? What's more important is that there's compute power there that we can leverage. Now, in our particular case, when we run the, when we create this cluster on our local machine using kind Kubernetes in Docker, we're really just going to be configuring a single node of compute power, which is going to be coming from Docker itself. So however you've configured Docker, I think I've configured Docker to have four CPUs in my environment, I think I've configured Docker to have four CPUs and six gig of memory, and well, we could look at it. But Docker is essentially gonna represent the machine that we're running on and the node itself. So this cluster, when I run it on my machine, will only have available to it four CPUs and six gigs of memory, um, right? With this one node sort of providing all that compute power. You will have to look at your Docker configuration to see, but I want at least this, if it's possible for you at, at your minimum, because I'm going to play with quotas at some point, and I'm assuming that the environment has at least four CPUs in it. So we've got a cluster. We're going to get our cluster up. It's got this compute power in terms of four CPUs in this memory. What's the next thing we have to think about? The next sort of thing that we think about is this idea of a pod. The pod, think of the pod again as sort of a compute environment, but where we can identify and configure the different binaries or services that we want to run with some sort of configuration. So you can have one service defined in this pod with some form of a configuration. And then you can have maybe a second pod that is responsible around this service that we build with some sort of configuration. And then what's kind of cool as well is you could have multiple services in the same pod and they're interacting with each other. It's nice to also think of a pod as a local 
right? It, it could also be a very, it's from a networking perspective, it's a local network. So these two services can communicate to each other over local host. Now, there are lots of reasons why you might want to have multiple services um, running and being managed together in a single pod. Also, the idea is that pods can be sort of replicated. So we can have three instances of this service running by having three instances of this pod running. If, and then with networking, we're not going to get into networking. But you can imagine that as requests come in for this pod, it can be load balanced across these particular pods. If one pod dies, you have redundancy there to still have two services that can handle it. This is another reason why we really focus about stateless services here, because the idea is that the pod is allowed, should be allowed to just go down, and Kubernetes will restart it if that happens. So in a, in a more production environment, we wouldn't just be running one instance of each pod, we would have multiple instances for that sort of redundancy. On our local dev environment, I want to keep the networking simple. So we're not going to be running any form of, say, replica sets in our dev environment. We're just going to run one instance of our pods um, for the pods that we want to define. Again, what's kind of nice is services within the scope of a single pod basically exist on a local network. So they can talk to each other really nicely. We can have pod to pod communication. We can set that up. And I'm going to show you how we can define essentially a namespace on the networking side for each pod. So the services can talk to each other inside this same cluster across pods. And we have like essentially DNS support for that kind of stuff to keep some of that networking. For the full course, visit courses.ardenlabs.com.